pleased to stand here in front of you all and welcome you to the first Annisfield Wolf author event, uh, author event of Cleveland Book Week 2022. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and give it a round of applause. I'm Tara Pringle Jefferson. Uh, I am the Digital Communications Manager of the Book Prize. The Annisfield Wolf Book Awards have honored the best writers tackling race and diversity for the past 87 years. Karen Long, manager of the Book Awards, who could not be here today because she's picking up another author uh, for their event a little bit later. Karen has often remarked that it is incredibly prescient that Edith Annisfield Wolf had the notion to fund these awards in 1935 and that her belief that literature can enhance justice is on point nearly 90 years later. This year, we're thrilled to be able to celebrate these authors in person with each of you, and we're especially excited to be able to kick off this year's author events with Danica Kelly, this year's winner for poetry. Her award-winning poetry collection, The Renunciations, was cited by juror Rita Dove as, quote, poetry of the highest order. Joyce Carol Oates, another Annisfield Wolf Book Awards juror, observed that Renunciations is a delicately rendered, toughly honest, courageous book. I'm excited to hear from Danica today. Um, to keep the show moving now, I'd like to introduce Daniel Hamilton of the LGBT Center of Greater Cleveland. Awesome. Hello, welcome to the LGBT Center of Greater Cleveland, uh, one of the oldest continually operating LGBT centers in the United States. Um, we have been serving and representing Northeast Ohio since 1975 through support, advocacy, education, and celebration. Our programs offering serve LGBTQ individuals across the lifespan from youth in our QU program to seniors through our SAGE program and everyone in between. We advocate through a robust community training program and we celebrate the community all year, but especially with our culminating event Pride in the Clee and our recently launched Pride Ride, which will be happening this October. Um, please check out the center and all the ways to get involved down at our front desk or on our website, lgbtcleveland.org. And we are so honored to be hosting the Cleveland Book Week and the Annisfield Book Awards presented by the Cleveland Foundation, um, and honoring Danica Kelly for the renunciations and the 2022 Annisfield Wolf Book sorry, Award winner for poetry. <laughs> Lots of words. <laughs> um, and we are also honored to be hosting all of you. So thank you very much. All right, so now we are getting into the meat of our program. Um, just a little bit about Danica before I bring her up. Um, in addition to winning this year's Annis Wolf Poetry Prize, Kelly's poetry has been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Publishing Triangle Awards, the Lambda Literary Awards, and long listed for the National Book Award. She earned an MFA from the University of Texas at Austin and a PhD in English from Vanderbilt. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, and The Paris Review. Zanika will be in conversation with Dr. Taj Hussein, co-owner and clinical director of Kindred Harbor Behavioral Health, a practice that specializes in trauma-informed and LGBTQ plus affirming counseling. Together, they will discuss Kelly's experience writing her award-winning collection as she followed her own therapeutic path recovering from trauma. For those of you in the audience who may need space to reflect either during or after our conversation, we have space out on the terrace right behind you um, through that door. And as you're listening to the conversation, you're listening to the reading, if there's any questions that come up, um, you should have received index cards when you checked in and you can write your questions anonymously. And you will come around and collect those in the basket um, so that you can, right there, <laughs> so that you can ask your questions and then Dr. Um, Taj will moderate. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I hope you are too. Please welcome Danika Kelly and Dr. Taj Hussein to the mic. Hello. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here and to see your faces and to get to share this space with you. Um, it feels like a number of dreams, but I love to be at an LGBT center. <laughs> it just feels, that feels right, it feels good. Um, and I'm so grateful to be reading as a part of Cleveland Book Week and um, as a recipient of the Annis Wolf 
Anisfield Wolf Book Awards. Again, so many words. Um, so uh, I'm going to read uh, from the Renunciations. The book, uh, the collection uh, does deal with uh, investigations of the in the way uh, uh, the speaker's experience of childhood sexual abuse sort of sits at the center of her life. I will not be reading those poems today. It's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> I don't want to be sad. I don't want y'all to be sad. Um, but if you would like to experience some exquisite sadness, you could get the book. <laughs> the poems are in there. It's just the poems are good, but it's it's a uh, it's a bit much for like you know four o'clock. Uh, so I'm going to read for about, uh, I'm just setting my timer. I'm going to read for about 15 minutes. Um, I believe I have chosen 10 poems. I might read a new poem if there's time, so we'll see. Uh, so I'm just going to read about getting divorced. Um, <laughs> it's not funny. That's the less sad track in the book. <laughs> it really does uh, uh, sort of throw things into perspective. Uh, all right. So. Um, thank you all again for your good attention. I'm starting my timer right now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit of mess about hiking here in a minute. Um, so there's a sequence in the book titled Dear, and then there's an M dash after it, sort of like a, the salutation to a letter. So, uh, and so I'm going to read several of those today. Dear, we come from abundance. Each season bowed with rain, but here is the earth eager to flame, the air like salt, thirsty even for the water we carry in our skin. New wanderers in this land, we do not know how to wait for water, have never waited so long for rain that every tree died, left to stand tender. For now, I watch the shoulder burn, drive through the smoke that blots the mountains and holds the old yoke of sun. I know nothing of fire, its reach, its spread, know only that every body makes its own ash, manages its own diminishing. So this next poem takes up um, Greek, this, this trope, I feel like that's not quite the right, right word, a device, a defense mechanism that I observed in uh, Greek mythology where there would be um, a major god chasing a minor, like a river nymph, and then like the river nymph's father would change the river nymph into like a tree, <laughs> or like reeds. They were like, we don't know what to do, because clearly this god is not getting the message. Uh, <laughs> a tree? That felt wild to me. I was like, that's, that's a strategy. So this is bedtime story for the bruised hearted. The trees were all women once fleeing a god wedded with lust, until their fathers changed them, bound their bodies in bark, and still the god took, a branch to crown his own head, the reeds to hold his breath. How like them, our fathers, those small gods who unearthed their children with rage, who scored the bark and bent the branch to bind their bodies with our own. Tonight, my love, we are free of men, of gods, and I am a river against you drawn to current and eddy, ready to make, to be unmade. So there are a number of poems in this book that deal with hiking. And my ex-wife really liked to hike. Um, <laughs> I don't like hiking. So you know the things we do for love. Um, and I feel like that was one of the things I was working through. <laughs> <laughs> like we were just like outside so much. Uh, I do like to be outside. I just like to sit and look. I don't want to walk up a hill and look. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is ours in Pathica, Muir Woods National Monument. We lived in the imperative. Walk through the tree. Spin in the light. Take dominion over one another. But about the tree, no euphemism there. A tree fell, a man with metal teeth ate the bark, the heartwood, the bark. We were like that then, eating and eaten, sawing and sawn. I mean, of course, our bodies, but also how we mounted together the hill. Be dizzy, said the sun. Be dizzy, said the blood. Be dizzy, said the heart and lungs and vessels between. How I cried at the summit. You blocked the sun and somewhere the ocean. 
what sweet anchor your eyes made. So the thing about hiking, this, I'm just, I'm just, I need to say this. It's just like, it. I'm an external processor. So it's like you hike all the way up to see the ocean, but then someone stands in front of you blocking the tiny, it's fine. <laughs> it's like, we could just go to the beach. <laughs> like, why would we? It's okay. All right. So this is uh, in the chapel of St. Mary's. I can't tell you what happened there, why I entered the sanctuary, a non-believer, only that I have been thinking about worship, the altar of the body, and supplication for some time. My thoughts turn, as they often do in this season of absence, to my wife and how tired a God can get when called, and too often, for little reason but loneliness. Of course, I don't mean God here, but rather the woman I love who alters the orbit of my life pulls me with the density of light toward her, the draw thinner when she is farther away as she is now. I try to find comfort in the inevitability of science when what I lack is faith. The sanctuary, the stained glass, four girls saturating it with soft chatter, small pots of stargazer lilies, a lace ribbon for each pew. This place is full of faith in the unknown, and I don't know how to believe in what I cannot see. Tonight, I will drive through the foothills and into the valley. I will try to make a little practice to trust you are with me, even though you are somewhere else. So this next poem is about being at a skating rink. <laughs> Nashville uh, has had, I don't know if it still does because I haven't lived there for a while now, but had a really great skating rink. Um, and I would go sometimes with my friends uh, on like Saturday night. Ah, anyway. So the, I like this poem because it reminds me of being at the skating rink. <laughs> uh, Citing Virtue, Rivergate Skate Center, Nashville, Tennessee. The man in orbit blooms a heart on his back. The heart blooms wings of water, and in me rises not mercy, but a sense of order. I've drifted, loosed from the one who bound me, a planet with no anchoring star. And I know this man is neither God nor sidereal body, but neither is he a woman with an alchemical heart. His skin, his beard, his full breast enrapture me, draw my gaze from every other whirling body. I've drifted. And I know the man in orbit is not a man in orbit, but one in revolution, where revolution means change or a way of moving, where muscle ripples to water, moves from a state of gold to one of lead. Okay, so this next poem, I don't know if y'all are sort of tracking this. Things have started to go downhill a little bit. Um, so, uh, so this next poem uh, does deal with um, suicidality, um, but I say that just to let, I'm okay, my speaker's okay, just a low moment. <laughs> um, and this is called Him. Dear river, dear creek, dear damned tributaries, dear fuse, dear dynamite and wet match, amen. The water don't love me, and she don't love me, and maybe I'm drowning from the inside. Who put the river in my arm said, don't let the water? Maybe the knife got a hard kiss and a sweet bite. Maybe the knife only metal and wood and a bit of brass, but maybe it know how to love the inside of me. Maybe I don't believe in meaning and God and plans and paths. And the closer I am to my animal self, the more human I am, the more I let myself break like a wave, ocean in my arm stone in my arm, iron and wood and brass in my arm. So the next poem <laughs> is just a, is about my buds. Um, have y'all ever had like a devastating tarot reading? I love how many people nod. Y'all are just like, yes. <laughs> have you ever had a devastating tarot reading in, a, with, like, in front of a group of your friends? <laughs> Because that's fun. <laughs> that's a good time. Uh, so this is called Siding Tarot, Pflugerville, Texas. And Pflugerville is a suburb of Austin. Okay. I learned how to hug here. 
how to draw a boundary and hold here against the gale force of my mother's late night rage and sob, learned too what it meant to be chosen, to choose, brought myself back to the receiving line. My chest cracked into two wet pieces after a fall, so lonesome I wasn't sure I'd survive, and met the arms practiced in mending. I asked Jenny to read my cards. Sid and Shannon on the couch behind me, Amber and Joe in the kitchen, Nat in from Berkeley, the kids running around, Carlisha, I'm sure, at my right hand. Jenny spread the Celtic cross, gestured as she does, which is to say grandly, at my present, at the problem we all knew. The past, the conscious and unconscious, waited for the cards to name what we could all see there at the position of hopes and fears. Three swords and one heart. How rude, I thought. <laughs> Do y'all see this shit? I said aloud, the room gone quiet. A relief not to have to say what I had known in the room where I had learned the kind of love possible between friends, now family, the kindness possible between partners, grateful for the rough blow finally landed and the net to catch me. Dear. <laughs> Sounds fun out there. Uh, <laughs> dear. Question. How do we process being overcome when we know the water is rising, rising because the sea ice is melting, melting because the animal we are shortens everything we touch into brief and useful pieces? Question. Can we call our marriage done, soon overcome, soon underwater, a city inhabited by whatever the sea brings to it? Question. How do you drown a city? Throw into the ocean every suffocation, the folded clothes, the lemon tree, a wife, anything that will sink as a stone. Dear one, is this too soon to call? I cannot swim and I will not drown. So this next poem is a hiking poem. <laughs> Why do people like to hike? <laughs> okay, so on this one, I went with one of my grandpa's good friends, his name's Steve, and Steve is like, like a Ned Flanders, Ted Lasso kind of person, <laughs> you know? Which is a lot. <laughs> And Steve kept saying, we're almost there, we're almost there. And we were not. <laughs> we absolutely were not. Like at no point were we almost there. Um, but that was fun. So this is called Sighting Almost, Vernal Fall, Yosemite National Park. Never mind the 600 stairs carved in granite, or my guide, a man with a mustache and no concept of almost, or my moaned, why are we going up this hill at every hill, or his response that what comes up must go down, or the somewhere we've almost reached. Mind instead the three friends who breached the safety rail for a picture on the rocks and were swept over the falls by a river gorged with the melting snowpack. How they must have held each other in their descent before the Merced broke them apart. That was some time ago. An old man hiking with his son-in-law flatters me. You are only pretending to be tired to make us feel better. <laughs> that wasn't true. The truth, I have come here to learn how not to kill myself. My guide takes my picture many times as we ascend. He captures Half Dome, El Capitan, Nevada Fall, and me, nearly upright, a silhouette before the sun. A dead thing that, in dying, feeds the living. I've been thinking about the anatomy of the egg, about the two interior membranes, the yolk held in place by the calaisi, gases moving through the semi-permeable shell. A curious phrase, the anatomy of the egg, as if an egg were a body, which it is, as if the egg could be broken, then mended, which, depending on your faith, broken, yes, but mended, well. Best to start again with a new body, voided from a warmer one, brooded and turned. Better to begin as if some small-handed animal had it knocked you against a rock, licked clean the rich yolk, and left the albumen to dry in the sun. As if a hinged jaw hadn't swallowed you whole. What I wanted, 
a practice that reassured that what was cracked could be mended or at least suspended so that it could not spread. But now I wonder, better to be the egg or scaled mandible? The small hand or the flies, bottle black and green, spilling their bile onto whatever's left, sweeping the interior, drinking it clean. I think something might have grown there, though. I know it was never meant to be eaten. It was always meant to spoil. So the last poem I read from the book um, is The Moon Rose Over the Bay. I had a lot of feelings. Um, and I really like this title, so there are actually two poems titled, <laughs> just like out in the world titled The Moon Rose Over the Bay. I had a lot of feelings because I felt like it was, it was too good to use only one time. Um, and also I'm going to read it again because I really like it. So The Moon Rose Over the Bay, I had a lot of feelings. The home I've been making inside myself started with a raising, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested, a cycle fallow said winter, said the ground is too cold to break pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watched it ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new groundwater, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it a pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it a song. Everything rushed past my small ears, were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood, about time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. So I want to read a new poem. Because I feel like, you know, that speaker's fine. But it's, I have new love poems. So, <laughs> so this one's for my sweetie. Um, it was a birthday. I was like, I'm going to write her a poem. <laughs> she doesn't mind. <laughs> But I definitely was like, I made this, and like, and she was like, she was like, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is titled, and this is the last one I'll read, and thank you for your attention. Um, this is titled, What is the Measure? I catalog what I cannot capture. The sun, its ragged stumble into rock face, the precise elevation of this plateau or the next, the sea, of course, against which everything is measured. My tools are insufficient, inexact. For instance, there is no way to measure the peak against the distance from the tip of one ring finger to the other, no matter my arm's position. Outstretched, limp, akimbo. For instance, there is no way to weigh the earth pushed out of earth against the gravity of my body, its bones, its sack, its, its sacks, its meat and animating light. I submit, I do not constitute the mountain. This in spite of the palette of old quilts and newly fallen maple leaves I've made at its immeasurable base. I submit, I do not constitute the field, although I have harrowed its length, its width, with my long feet, my slow step. Never mind I hear what scurries or scatters, what burrows or bounds. Never mind I raise my hand to hover the bent grass, the echinacea's bald crowns all of which rot, withers or writhes, all of which is new or nearly the same before my foot's next fall. I submit, as with the mountain, the field, as with the field, you, ineluctable as a season, sun ragging the rock face, your arm nearly as long as mine, your palm wider, your mouth a beginning, your eyes, of course, that against which everything else is measured. You harrow and the summit writhes. Your broad foot falls and the field akimbo gives up its gravity, lets loose its bodies, its bones, thrums, and animating light. Thank y'all. So we're waiting for the, the questions, correct? Or for people to pass their questions around? Or I think we chat for a minute oh, okay. and then we'll I got let them. Yeah, okay. and so. we'll let people gather their questions and got it. Yeah. So I actually do get to use these. Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much for that. I really, um, really enjoyed reading your book. Oh, thank you. I told you I used an explicative to describe it earlier. <laughs> it was when I told you how awesome it was. Um, and um, 
I'm just really grateful for this opportunity to, to come here and just talk to you. And um, like I was told, we're just going to talk and have a conversation right. about, <laughs> about, yeah, about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so um, some of the questions that I thought of um, that maybe we could think about was um, your opinion or how you look at um, poetry or writing as or the transformative or healing power of, of writing mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, writing is such an important part of how I understand myself as a person in the world. <laughs> it's, it's become sort of a grounding aspect of my identity. And in writing the poems for this book, um, <laughs> it was a lot. The poems were coming. So there, like I, as I mentioned earlier, there are these poems that, um, there are these two sections in the book that deal with childhood sexual abuse. And those poems just started coming. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to write these poems. This is terrible. Uh, and because the poems were coming, I knew I needed um, more support than I had. So I started um, with the uh, um, Courage to Heal um, workbook. And, or the Courage to Heal, and then also paired that with the workbook, which was really helpful. Um, but at the time, I was adjuncting in California, and so did not have access to a therapist, which had been like the first time in a really long time that I had not had access to a therapist, because I've been in therapy, except for that one year for like 20 years. <laughs> so fortunately, I got a new job. I was able to go to therapy. I was going once a week while I was writing this book sometimes twice a week um, if it and for different reasons for like not uh, just because of that but I needed that support where I was like externalizing in therapy some of the stuff that was coming up so that I would have enough distance when I was writing um, writing the poems and so the poems themselves tend not to be or at least I don't understand them as just recounting the events of having been abused but rather um, the writing allowed me to investigate how I was letting that story about myself, the story I was telling myself about having been abused and how that shaped who I was, like how I was letting that sit at the center of myself. The writing allowed me to externalize that and push against that narrative. Um, the, one of the things I love about poetry is like it really, at least like the lyric, really does resist narrative and I find that really helpful for investigating um, and disrupting. Okay. Well, I guess it's just going back because you mentioned um, like what I love about poetry, one element of it. So, what how what sparked your interest in poetry initially? Oh, I don't know. I was <laughs> I was young and I had a lot of feelings. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Um, and I still feel really confused. It's like sometimes I wake up and I'm like, this is what I do. This is the genre that I write in. This is the one that makes sense. Because in some ways, I do like po poems are hard. Like I have to, both in the writing but also reading sometimes, like I have to be in my most attentive space to show up with the work and for the work. And I don't always think about myself as like a very attentive person, so it's like it feels a little bit counter inside, but I think poetry asks me to attend to the world that I'm a part of and to be present and be in my body. And I feel really grateful for that because I'm always looking for, um, are sparked by material of just like walking around and being with my folks and hanging out with my old dog, you know, um, and having and also always having a lot of feelings. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of I told you I really want to ask you this question in the other room and wanted to bring it up again. So like when I think about um, writing, putting to paper um, some of some of the you know darker moments of your life, things that you and struggles and things that you had to had to um, thrive from and survive from. Mm -hmm. And just the idea of like laying yourself bare and just making it really, just putting it out there for people to consume. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you cope with that? How do you decide what to share and how to share it? I'm gonna say something slightly different or maybe very different from what I said um, when we were talking earlier. So another thing that I, and I'll just actually tie this back to your other question, one of the things that I really like about poetry is the artifice. <laughs> I like all the different things that one can become absorbed in, like, oh, what is the length of the line? Where am I turning the line? What is the shape? What is this voice doing? What point of view am I using? 
and that creates distance between and I don't and that distance is really productive for me that distance between the experience and then like the work that it takes to transform an experience into art um, as opposed to um, a, a more simple recounting like I, I take comfort in the artifice mm -hmm. um, it doesn't so then I don't feel as bare yes um, but also I do like thinking about the speaker and uh, I used to not think about the speaker as a figure that was different for me but what uh, I was talking with uh, Amy Nezakubatatiel. I was visiting her class. She's a wonderful poet. Um, I was visiting one of her classes, and she asked me who the speaker was in my first book, and I was like, "It's me!" And she was like.